so much to everyone for coming out. My name is Marcia Hennish. Um, I work in the Office of Global Engagement and um, really delighted to see so many people here today for this training, special training from our partners um, at OnCall. Uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Jeff Diamond, who is our account manager and works closely with us whenever there is an incident. So, um, you know, if you know me, uh, that may be because you've had an incident, but I actually really want to know you before there's an incident. It's good for you to understand who's that person um, picking up the phone and, and what is she like and how is this going to turn out. So um, hopefully um, now that you know me, if this is your first time meeting me, you'll, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable with making that call. Some of you, like Kelsey, feel no qualms whatsoever. Hey Marsh, how's it going? Got a situation. Um, so I do ask for you just to sign in um, and, and that way we can share PowerPoints and things like that with you afterwards. Um, and uh, so I'll just pass this around and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Sure. I mean, I'm just going to leave these up here. Um, they're just some resource documents. Some of you may already have these, like our um, handbook that we do for faculty and program leaders, um, and the downloading of our emergency card for your phone, and then the old-fashioned phone, and then this is just my lovely promo piece of this is what I do in case you don't know. But feel free to take that if it's, if it's helpful to you, um, and I'll just send that around for people to sign in. So Jeff, without further ado, I will let you take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, like Marcia said, my name is Jeff Diamond. I'm your account manager with On Call International. Um, so we'll just do a quick intro so we all know, you know kind of who's in the room. Uh, if you can just say your name and what school you're with, that'd be great. And, and I would also just suggest to you, look at who else is in this room, because these are also your resources when you're thinking about program development or, or challenges and whatnot. So. <coughs> Oh, Hi, I'm Brenda Dyer. I'm with Global Studies and Modern Languages in OAS, and I'll be going to France this summer on the Mobile Media Program. Uh, I'm Frank Rowe. I'm with the Science School of Public Health, and we're going to the Capital. I'm Sandy with uh, College of Medicine. I am in support for physicians and things like that. Even if anybody's traveling and needs somebody to go, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm John Rupar. I'm with Arthur J. Gallagher, your insurance broker. All right, well, thank you all for coming today. Um, the goal of the meeting is really to just discuss your internal processes, procedures, in the event that something does arise while you're traveling. Um, so please feel free to ask as many questions as you can, and we really just want to have an open discussion of what to do if something happens. All right, so our first scenario. Uh, we have a traveler. They're in Israel, and they have fallen ill. So you're familiar with the location, you brought him to the hospital. Um, he's ill, but you feel comfortable with the facility and it's not a critical <coughs> situation. So what would you do? Maybe take a minute to talk with your neighbor about what you would do and then we'll share broadly. Sometimes it's easier to talk with your neighbor first. So. <laughs> 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 I'm like, check out the little, like, what's the little, like, 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 the little, <laughs> All right, so what, what steps are you going to take? You have a student, they're ill, they're at the hospital seeking treatment. What are you going to do next? Call who? I'll call you. That's a good, good answer, yeah. So as soon as it's safe to do so, you should reach out to On Call International. We're going to start medically monitoring the situation, making sure they're getting appropriate care, etc. Um, do you have any other resources to support that student while they're they're ill? Yeah, so I mean, you can call on call's number or you can call my number, and then typically maybe you can kind of walk them through mm -hmm. opening a case and sure. that type of thing. Yeah, so to open a case, it doesn't have to be the patient. It could be any one of you. It could be mom, dad, friend, family. Um, whoever it may be can open a case. So we will open a case with very limited information if that's all you have. Um, if you want to just provide us their name, uh, where they are, and what they're experiencing, we'll provide a case reference number. And once you get further information, give us a call or have the patient give us a call and we'll just continue filling in those fields. Um, so with that said, once we have that case reference number, Please make sure that you have that. So if any information is needed, if we need to follow up on anything, once you call, just say, we already have a case open. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll proceed accordingly. Mm -hmm. And I would say also in this scenario, um, if you have opened up a case with on call, they will typically let me know that a case has been opened. Um, but you can also call me directly, and I can kind of start stepping in to provide some support to um, help you think about what what other things we might need to address in this situation. Um, sometimes it's pretty straightforward. You just take them to the hospital and they're getting the care that they need and there aren't any surprises in the situation. That's, those are the situations that we most like to manage, right? That just kind of go according to plan. Um, but it's good for us to be aware um, that you know a student is in the hospital and if, if there are things that, that we need to do on, on our end to be sure that um, there's the proper support or communication that's, that's being provided. And also I think just kind of helping you to think through, okay, what else should we be thinking about here? Um, <coughs> you know, there's the student at hand, but there's also the other students and, and those types of things. So. So in this situation, um, you're comfortable with the facility, the patient is comfortable with the facility. If for whatever reason we find that they are not able to provide adequate care, we would start the medical evacuation process to an appropriate facility. What if they're not comfortable with the facility? If they're not comfortable with the facility, please let us know. Um, we'll have our medical team review, make sure they're getting the appropriate care, and if not, we're going to transport them to another facility. Can give them what they need. And sometimes what we find is there is a discomfort with the facility because there may be language barriers um, and problems communicating with the treating physician. 
but the actual care that's being provided is appropriate for that region and is appropriate for that condition. So we want to hear that feedback from you if there's anything making the patient uncomfortable, making you uncomfortable, because we may be able to speak with the hospital staff there and address that. You can also utilize translator services um, through the Global Response Center. So just know that there's resources. Feel free to tell us what you're experiencing and we'll address it as best we can or explain why the care here is appropriate. Um, and there's sometimes just going to be things that are not up to the same standards as here, obviously. Mm -hmm. What is the position of the faculty member in terms of con confidentiality issues? Because obviously we want to give you some information, but at the same time we want to make sure that we don't infringe on privacy laws or something. So, any questions are we supposed to ask the student or the hospital or? I think it depends on how much they're comfortable giving you information. If their expectation is that you're going to open a case for them and help them through it, then they're going to be able to give you information and you can give that to us. If they do not want to share information with you, then we are one of the first steps on the first call is that we're asking for consent to share information with designated people at Drexel. Marcia is one of those designated people. So we are asking their consent to share information in order to support their their needs and their traveler in the traveler in that situation. Um, so we can maintain confidentiality between us and the student and only share information that they have um, told us we can share. So I, I would say it depends on <coughs> their comfort level with you. So um, once the, the case is open, you communicate directly with the student and the hospital. The, the facility, you know, yeah, the I mean, realistically, the on the ground, if there's somebody that is there with the student, um, and in some circumstances, you might choose to stay there with them, in other circumstances, you might return to your group we will always maintain contact directly with the patient as long as they're communicating with us and comfortable doing that. Um, but we engage our resources on the ground as well. You're a valuable asset to us because you're there and you can see what's going on. So um, I would say how involved you are depends on how involved you're comfortable being and the support that you can <coughs> that student use. I forget, did they sign some sort of uh, additional or before they go? They do, but um, as uh, Jeff was sharing with us in an earlier session, um, in these scenarios, it's case specific. So even though we have that broader document that says, yes, Drexel can act on my behalf, for each incident, we would need to have a separate authorization for, for us to get information about that specific incident. And I think this is something that you can also kind of bring up to your students in pre-departure orientation um, when they're paying attention to these things. Um, you know, just remember that, you know, if something happens, you know, we may ask for consent, and the reason why we're doing that is so we can get you the best possible support. Um, you know, we haven't had a case yet where they've said, nope, Jackson can't have any information. Um, I suppose now that I've said that, I'll get one. Um, but, um, you know, I generally have found that um, our students are very willing to share that information. And I'm not a medical doctor, so uh, I'm really just taking down factual information. You know, this is the doctor, or what, this is what we're seeing. Um, and then using medical professionals um, through on-call or the local doctor to, to make any kind of determination. Have you ever had an issue, not that I want this to happen, where they, their physicians or whatever will not speak with you, or is this common in other, like those countries, they know these people traveling have these services? That, that is why it is fabulous to have on call, because they do doctor to doctor communication. Mm -hmm. um, so if the doctor says, no, I, who is Marsha Hennish? I don't want to speak with her. Um, we have that resource, and that, that's most commonly how we get the information about the actual status, of, mm -hmm. medical status of, of the student. Yeah, in some areas of the world, um, Italy, for instance, sometimes they just don't want to work with international companies, whatever it may be. Sometimes they even say that they speak English, but they won't just because they don't want to. 
Um, yeah, so what we will do is we'll work with our local partners. Um, they are, they have designated regions that they work with and we'll facilitate those calls through them so we can kind of get around those situations. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, we're gonna find out. So later that day, um, the student had a simple procedure and they were in recovery. You visited the hospital, he's doing okay. Um, you expect that he's going to be admitted for one more day. Um, and he will be discharged and be able to continue with the trip, is the expectation. But the next morning, you will wait to find out he's already returned to the trip. Um, when asked about it, he's really not answering questions. So what would you do and what resources would you reach out to? to oh, <laughs> That's going to be a fairly consistent answer across the board. And what, what do you need in order to get the information as quickly as possible, the case number? Yes. We yep. can look up cases by name as well, but it's mm -hmm. just a quicker way to just get right down to it. Yep. And on that plan ID card um, that everyone should have with them, there is that dedicated line. It's specific to Drexel, so no one else has that number. Um, so once you call that, we know that it's a Drexel or <coughs> administrator on the other line. We're able to pull up that information pretty quickly. All right, so how do you find out what happens? Call on call. Got it right. Yeah. Call on call. So, so chances are we're medically monitoring and we may have a medical report in hand at that point. You also could call Marsha's team because she is getting updates from on call. Yes. Um, so that's probably the quickest way to find out what happened. Um, if he's supposed to be in the hospital one more day and suddenly he's back with the group. Hmm. That's a big fun one, right? He doesn't want to miss out. Yeah. Is the, would they, would the hospital call on call in that case if, if, a, if a student was there and just left? And they went in and he wasn't there, or not necessarily? Not necessarily. It, it depends. It's, it's yeah. case specific. So if they have a good rapport with us and, and we've you know, been talking to them pretty frequently, they may likely reach out to us, um, but they might not if they left on their own frequently. Yeah, some of them will only do it if um, we ask for the next round of information. All right, so we found out he's been discharged. Um, on calls confirmed with the medical facility that the student left early against their medical advice and before he was cleared to travel um, with no complications. So your group is in the current location, you're going to be there for two more days and then after that you're going to be on a field site for four days. Uh, there's going to be limited medical care at that location um, so obviously there's concerns with the student being able to continue with the program. Um, how would you proceed? What steps would you take to ensure that he is okay to continue with the program? Maybe talk with your partner for a minute. How, how would you proceed? Against medical advice. I know. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Send him home. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's having a trouble. 
Okay, here, let's just get him off the trip, right? Well, if you have two more days trying to get him on call and for a follow-up, yeah. or pick up? Yes. Have him sign a waiver or something? I think I would pretty much tell the kid, you've got, I need a medical clearance, yeah. uh, otherwise you're not continuing on this trip. And because I think that you know, it could be as simple as just taking them back to the doctor, getting that medical approval. But if that is <coughs> something that's going on, and you don't know what it is, and that, you know, I don't, I don't think we have any medical doctors in this room, and you know, um, you need to be sure that that student is okay. We would absolutely back you up on that. Um, if you want, we could even put that in writing. You know, sorry, this kid cannot continue on the program unless they've been medically cleared. So are most of these trips for credit for things, or so yeah. basically yeah. they would want to continue on the trip because they want that credit, right? And it would be hard to participate. A little leverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So. Especially if you're going to take a, a flight, mm -hmm. um, there are certain obviously symptoms that can get worse if yeah. you're exposed to high altitudes, etc. So we want to make sure that. Whatever they experienced isn't going to worsen based on travel, um, so it is likely they may need to go back to the doctor for a follow-up and have them complete what's, complete what's called a fit to fly form. Okay. All right, so we have another scenario for you. Um, this one, a student in your group is displaying um, abnormal behavior that's different from the previous weeks. You're not 100% sure, uh, but based on your experience, you may think that their, uh, their state of mind is altered due to drug use. So to your knowledge, um, she's not prescribed any medications. Um, what are your next steps? How would you approach a situation like this? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they don't have much guile. They tell you stuff, but uh -huh. I wish they didn't. 
Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question about prescribed medications. Um, so if they sign this waiver of allowing us to, you know, you know kind of hit the waiver or whatever, um, would we know if they're on prescribed medications? Mm -hmm. Or would it be a yes? Well, if they're if, oh, yeah, only if they told you. Right. They complete a medical questionnaire. Right. So if, if questions <coughs> to prescriptions, if they disclose it, but they don't always. Yeah, but I have that point. I found that when reviewing some of the files, there's an automatic pre-fill. So I thought that every single student, men and women, that I was going with was on birth control. And I said, so it's, it's um, there's no automatic No, I mean, it was like, here's an example of the oh. types of medication. I might have just been reading it incorrectly. And birth control was put on there, and so that's... Yeah. Because that might be one that people don't think about as a prescribed medication. Uh, right. It is. Right. Yeah. I think that we did. When yeah, we were creating the form, we wanted to give the students mm -hmm. some okay. guidance on, on what kind of information we were looking for. So I think we did use that as an yeah. example. <clears throat> so I think that it just that prompts out. the student to indicate not only the prescription, but what they're taking for. So it gave an example of whatever the birth control was and then birth control. So that way when they're putting in their prescriptions, they actually are also indicating what they're taking it for. Okay. So that's, yeah. And I will say that, that as part of our process, we are reviewing to see what kind of medications they're taking. And, and if it's something that's for a mental health condition um, or, or anything else, if it's a heart condition, um, we may follow up with them and just say, hey, have you thought about how this is going to play out in the local environment? Is there, um, is there any kind of additional support that you're going to need for this, et cetera? Um, we found the students to be very receptive to this. Um, you know, the, the easiest ones are the allergies. You know, oh, do you have your EpiPen? And do you know how to say this in the local language? That kind of thing. But um, I think, you know, if you do it in a way that's, sensitive to student and you're really just, as you said, showing, I'm, I'm concerned, I care about you, I want this to be a good experience, um, you know, we found that the students are, are pretty responsive to that. So. All right, so the last scenario we have. Um, while you're on your program. Wait, 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 what happened? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> they say no. Yeah, they said no, I think it's good, nothing changed. Yes. Yeah, there's no challenge in this one, it's just a, how do you address yeah. it? Yeah. We could make up one. Mm -hmm. The students on drugs. Marshall! Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 don't they sign something that says they won't even do the, if it's legal there, they won't even do that? Um, not, well, what, what we say is illegal drug use. They, okay. um, it is included in, uh, basically they're subject to local <laughs> laws while they're abroad. Um, you know, which becomes a, a tricky thing for a lot of our students in locations. They are able to legally drink. Um, it's actually something that uh, we've been working on with uh, student life care is putting together some student behavior standards that will be very clear because this isn't what we have had in place in the past of if this happens then this is the consequence um, and so we are putting together some structures for that um, but our position has been that you know if, if they're allowed to drink in that country they can do that, do that um, but it shouldn't impede <coughs> their ability to participate in the program and obviously it's not open bar on Drexel's tab uh, there's a reasonable amount that, you know, if, if you're after a case when we were in um, Zambia, we did a champagne toast and that was fine, um, but we didn't say free for all at the bar, you know, God, you guys rocked it, like, let's go crazy. Kind of thing. <laughs> Don't want to be in, in that position. So um, what they do on their free time is another question, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of our faculty members have kind of addressed this early on in their orientation program. This is an intense program, and you um, you are expected to be on time, and you know whatever you're doing the night before can't impede your ability to to fully participate. You can't be so hungover that you're not able to interact. And the other thing I would say to faculty members, and we've talked about this a lot, 
keep those students busy. Keep them busy. If they don't have a lot of free time, they're not gonna, you know, if you run them ragged from nine o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night, they're just, you know, I mean, I know that they're still gonna rally in some ways, but if they're busy, um, they don't tend to have as much time to get themselves into trouble. So, and it is supposed to be an intensive course. So um, I, I know a lot of our courses really are like that. The kids don't have a lot of time to, to get themselves into trouble. I mean, I think in this particular case, how do you prove it? You know, if a student is just acting strangely, and so um, that's, it is where I would be sure that you reach out to us and that you're documenting this, and, and if we're seeing this repeated behavior, um, you know, we're kind of talking about the three strikes and you're at, you know, one warning and then, you know, a verbal warning <coughs> that you document. Um, you know, the next would be with a written warning and then final, we, you know, we could remove a student from a program that is possible. We have talked with general counsel, we could do this, so. Yeah. <laughs> So-called Drexel, not all. Again, this case, the, this in this standpoint. case, yes. Yeah. But so, let's take the opportunity to say maybe this is not drugs. Maybe she is starting to experience uh, mental health symptoms that are coming on. That often happens when you put, mm -hmm. yeah, you, yeah. It, uh, a lot of times people say, oh, you're going to have this wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. You've been depressed for a while. This is the best time to go. It'll pick you right up. And the opposite happens, right? Um, it just exacerbates something that is emerging from them. So um, I think closely paying attention to the behavior of the student as it's changing and make sure they know if you want to talk to somebody on call can look into local counselors and what's available and make an appointment. Um, there are some places where if someone is experiencing uh, mental health symptoms, you do not necessarily want to bring them to the emergency department unless they are <coughs> expressing that they're going to hurt themselves or something because mental health stigma, depending on where you are, can be getting. So that's all information that we can help you with. Um, but so a question about medications. What if they run out of their medication that's more serious than flu medication, you know, I mean, uh, asthma or uh, allergy medication? You know, it's like a psychotropic medication or something serious. Sure, um, yeah. And um, they tell us about this. So can you guys help with that? Yeah, definitely. They, we do offer prescription replacement. Um, so what we would do is once we're informed that they need you know, a replacement medication, we'd set up a referral to a local facility, get them an appointment. They would go and be evaluated. They would rewrite the prescription. Oh, okay. And if they don't have that local equivalent of or the same medication, we would find the closest local equivalent and we'd be able to okay. facilitate that. Just the payment of that medication should go through their primary insurer. Which means they'll probably have to pay out of pocket for it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a med claim. Yeah. Yeah, because they know they're supposed to bring it out, but if they lost it or something, sorry, they're right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, yeah. Or a shower bag gets stolen yeah. and all their medicine for right. yeah. 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 I don't know if you want to talk about the stealing of medication. <laughs> yeah, so um, prescriptions are heavily coveted in some countries. So where it might be an illegal drug there, or a controlled substance, and your students are bringing it into the country. There's a lot of theft. There's a lot of fraud also. So some <coughs> students knowing that it can't be uh, found in the country would sell it and then say, oh, someone stole it or I lost it or I, I misplaced it. It's just gone from my room. Uh, those claims, when it is an insured benefit, are really heavily investigated because it's become such a huge problem. So really cautioning your students when they're taking prescription drugs, not just to have enough or a buffer enough, but to really protect it and keep it locked up when they can. Um, what about going through customs? Would customs take medicine? They can. Um, so prior to the trip, if you have any concerns with that, have them reach out to on call and we'll be able to tell you if it's legal within that country. There is some medication that countries don't accept and they, you know, deem it illegal. Um, so what if you had a doctor's note? No. Not there. Yeah. 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 So which which becomes part of our discussion with the student is 
you know, is there a local alternative that they would be able to take during their time when they're there, or is that so critical to their well-being that this isn't the appropriate location for them? Um, so, you know, if, I think that's always a challenge when, when they can't have what they normally um, use uh, in a location, but it's much better to know that ahead of time. Um, and, you know, one of the things, we have a lot of proactive services with on-call where you can get pre-trip assessments, you can find out about prescriptions, you can look at the security environment, all of these things that you could do proactively, which I know when you're getting ready to leave and, you know, you've got all these things going on, um, it's hard to think about doing those things. We do try to push the students to be proactive because what we're really trying to do is make lifelong smart world travelers and that, you know, that's kind of the way I look at this is that we're teaching you things you're going to use for the rest of your life. So let's figure out how to do this now so that, you know, it, this is just happenstance for you. But um, I think, you know, to the extent that you can encourage them to be proactive in that way, um, I think it, it will really serve everyone's interest very well. So. Your medication what legal comment made me think about medical marijuana, which could be an issue this year now that mm -hmm. it's legal here. So is that something we should just bring up to the students? And, and I think you need to remind them that they're subject to the laws in the local country. Right. And, and what they assume, and assumption that it's okay there does not mean that it is okay there. And I think that that is this dangerous area for us in higher education is that especially within campuses we tend to say oh bad you shouldn't have done that but we want you to move on so there aren't going to be a lot of consequences you know but that might happen here on campus but that will not happen in a local environment we have had students arrested for drug possession and it's not fun for anyone um, you know so uh, you know and I think sometimes saying to students there have been Drexel students that have been arrested for drug possession. Now, we do not have get out of jail free cards. On call does not have, we, we tried to get that from them, but the premium <laughs> went up so high we couldn't afford it. And so, um, you know, but just kind of laying that out there. And, you know, again, there's so many other great things that they could be doing with their time. You know, why, why do that? Come back here and do that. You know, that's fine, whatever. But um, don't do it abroad in an environment where you really don't understand what the consequences are. And keep in mind, too, that it is not federally legal. So if you have to go on a right. flight. Yeah, even in another yeah. state. Exactly. Not necessarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but so. I don't know that the students would necessarily understand that. No, I don't think they would. Right. It's not too hard, from what I understand, to get the permission. So. Yeah, that's what I understand. Do they get kicked out of their program here if they get arrested there? Uh, there can be student conduct um, ramifications for that, yeah. It, it, the cases that we've had have gone through student conduct upon their return. Mm -hmm. so. Have you ever had a case in which the student is kicked out of the program on site? So for whatever reason, these issues happen and then you say like, okay, two strikes, you're out. What does it mean you're out? Like, you get them out of the hotel or something? Or? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we had one or two, but it was actually, it was actually, <laughs> we had other cases, but they were short right. term long programs. Um, we had one so far. Get arrested or an ICA? He dismissed from the program. So Did you dismiss them from, sorry, right then and there? Or send them home immediately? Well, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, this incident kind of built up and it was the last night of the program, so the next day they would have been leaving anyway. Um, but they had a day's worth of activities that last day, so he was dismissed basically the second to the last day from the program. So he wasn't sent home and they will leave the next day anyway, but he wasn't permitted to participate in any of the program at that point. Can they choose to stay or do they have to come? Oh, so they, they would have to leave the Drexel secured housing. Right, but I mean, in these cases, it's very difficult to actually force them mm -hmm. to go home. Um, I've heard of cases where 
kid said, fine, I'm just going to go do my own thing. I've got my plane ticket. Yeah, like that um, sick case. Like, what do you force them to do? Like, they, can, they can no longer participate on the Drexel-affiliated activities. But if they choose to stay in Israel and do things, then, you know, that's on them. But they're, but they're not permitted. But, you know, how do you enforce that? They probably have the itinerary. You know, they show up where you are mm -hmm. and, you know, if you say, okay, we're not paying for you. Uh, you do know, you cancel oh. the flight home or you're just not no. you? No. Does it happen? <laughs> they they have their own flights. Oh, okay. So you <coughs> like you would actually kick them out of the house. And that would go over well. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Speaking as a mother of a college student, consequences. <laughs> yep. Yeah. What is that? Putting them at danger? Is that like a legal standpoint that Drexel's putting them in a situation? Yeah. I mean, the student is living in residential housing on campus and is dismissed. They are removed from the dorm. But I'm saying in another country, if it's not safe for them to not travel with a group and you put them out there, and we, we would provide notification to emergency contacts that this is what's happening. Um, you know, obviously the well-being of the student is an important consideration, but if they have violated things, and you know, typically this is not going to, well, we, we did include in our language really egregious behavior could just be Sorry, that was three strikes all at once, and you're out. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in terms of being sure that they're safe and they have their ticket and their passport, and you know they're moving on their way, yes, we're gonna, you know, try to provide that. But ultimately, in that role, it's gonna be the emergency contact or the student that that needs to take responsibility for them at that point. In the same way, if something happened here, you know they would then be responsible for themselves. So, I mean, it is a little different environment, and, um, you know, it comes into question, if, especially if you're in a high-risk travel area where you've basically said, our groups stay together at all times. Um, you know, how, how we would do that. Um, yeah, but I'm thinking that the, the case that I know from another institution was sexual harassment, which in the group, but you did in the group, and so you're not gonna keep one student at risk because you don't want to kick out this other student who is sexually harassing a student in your group. So I suppose that there are circumstances in which you just have to do it. But hopefully, I mean, if you only had to do that once here, we're talking about thousands of people. That's, and, and what you're saying is that there's an emergency list, so you can, I mean, I, I, I would assume we would contact you, Marsha, mm -hmm. and we would initiate this process of contacting right. their, their student's emergency. Okay. Right. And I think one thing I, I would like to clarify, my, my name is <coughs> up as a contact many times, which is great, that's fine. But you also need to understand that with any case that I am managing, it is not just me working on that case. We have teams here at Drexel that would be activated. Obviously, if it's an ICA, um, I'm going to be working with Education Abroad staff. Uh, general counsel may be involved in that. Um, you know, it's. It, you never want to just have one person making these decisions. You know, what if I'm having a bad day? So we have these teams, and, and people know that they're on these teams, and um, you know, we would be working through with it. Um, the other thing that we have that's a resource for us that's actually fantastic is that there is a network of people that do work similar to what I do. And these people are so generous with their information and their time. Um, you know, when we had a student that was arrested on drug possession, you know, I went out to our listserv and said, hey, here's how my Tuesday's going. And I immediately got two phone calls from people who had already been through that scenario and started saying, okay, here, here are some things that you should take into consideration. Here's how you can do that. So, um, you know, I think the hard thing for us in our typically very American way is we want the issue resolved immediately. Like, well, let's get this wrapped up in the next three hours because we're supposed to be in, you know, Salamanca and, you know, it's going to be this amazing dinner. And unfortunately, 
sometimes that's just not going to happen. And that doesn't mean that people are not trying to address the issue, but just it just takes time uh, in other contexts. I mean, I think it also takes time here. It's just the local environment supports the moving it through quickly and we'll deal with consequences later. And in, in some places, I mean, I think often about the Italians and they're like moving along with things, but it just doesn't feel like they're taking it all that seriously. They are, they're taking it very seriously, but they have a process and they're gonna go through that. And so sometimes it's for us to say, all right, we're gonna have faith that, that this is moving along and, and we're gonna, you know, we can complain to Marsha, I don't understand, but you know, we're gonna work through this environment. So, okay, I think we beat that one. Today. <laughs> <laughs> but this is good discussion, and I think it's really great to, for us to kind of consider these things and you know, make up things that, of how it might play out. All right, so while you're on your program, uh, students come to you uh, with a request. So through social media, they found out about a local event that's very relevant to the topic that they're studying. Uh, the engagement doesn't interfere with any planned curriculum, and this is a great opportunity uh, for you and your students. However, the event is controversial uh, with some groups in the region, and there's some risk of public disruption. So is this an event that you would consider allowing them to go to, or having the entirety of the group go to. So we're going to Atlanta. Yeah. The 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 yeah. That might be an example. <laughs> that is a good example. <laughs> like, hey, you want to do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what would you do? Would you consider it? Would you reach I out to research. Drexel? Oh, I yeah. need to. Uh, yeah. How I, controversial? Yeah, I don't know. How, is there potential for violence? <laughs> We do not call. Don't you like threat, threats? We do. Yeah. Yes, we do. We have an internal security team. Um, so if you do fear any public disruptions or safety, give us a call. Ask to speak with someone in security, and they'll pass you right along to them. They'll provide you some on-the-spot advice um, for what they're seeing in the region and what they expect to see in the region. Um, we won't tell you. Yes, you should do this, or no, you shouldn't, but we're going to give you the information to make that decision. And I think if it's a, something that impacts the entire group, I don't know if it would be your preference that the initial question comes in to the team who might decide on the overall risk decisions for the university. So it might depend on the individuals in your group. Do you feel comfortable that they are mature enough to handle the circumstances of this situation? So all those individual risk profiles is something that's taken into consideration from our team, but I think you would want to be involved in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think when, when we have the itinerary come in, we take a, a look at, at the things that people are doing, and of course, we want you to be able to take advantage of some unique opportunities, but also to have some information about what you're walking into um, so that, you know, maybe you can make a decision um, that's, that's well informed. And obviously, um, using the on-call security team um, is a great, uh, great resource for you. We had an earlier spreadsheet today and they were showing uh, my utilization of the risk team and it's like, uh, you know, everyone by first name, I'm like, oh, I know them all by first name now. I don't even have to say it's Marsha Hennish. I just say, hi, it's Marsha. Um, looking for an assessment on Haiti. Could you help me out here? Um, but I think also in, in these cases, as wonderful as on-call is, we don't just rely on on-call. You know, there are OSAC risk analysts that we can talk to. Um, you know, again, my colleagues at other institutions uh, that, that might weigh in so that we're making an assessment. Um, I would say, especially if your itineraries are very packed as they should be, you just might not be able to do that, but you might be able to use that event uh, in your course as a, as a topic for discussion later to see how things came out and to pull out the fact that there was no controversy to it. We do not recommend going to protest at all. We just don't recommend that. Um, we know that they might, you know, be very well aligned with the locals and they want to show their support. 
Um, they can show their support from afar. Because um, the issue with protests is that sometimes they turn very quickly. What it starts out peaceful um, becomes violent. I mean, I think we've seen this in, in Paris, for sure. Um, and I think the other thing, too, in some places, a uh, presence of a bunch of American college kids would not be welcomed. Uh, in that protest and would actually make them a, a target. So uh, that's an interesting thing for you to discuss in the safety of your hotel, um, you know, but not something that you would really want to engage in. Mm -hmm. um, question about the pre-trip assessment, yeah. right, for specific trips. Mm -hmm. um, would you suggest doing that, like, the relatively, um, like a few weeks or a close, a few close to the event, we have time to go because the conditions might change. And, and does that does that assessment include the security risk? Yeah. So if you need the the full pre trip assessment, just request it through Masha, and we'll facilitate that. Um, but I will show you in a second. I'll show you some resources that you do okay. have that are accessible to all of Drexel and okay. other And and I will also say that um, through the the resources that we have through on call with the searchlight portal, I set up alerts for places where I know that we have frequent travelers, um, or if it's an unusual place and I know we're going to have travelers going in there shortly, I set up these alerts. So I will get alerts I, every morning when I get up and I have this long list in my inbox of these are all the places where things are going on. So I'm also monitoring that in anticipation that you're going to have a group there. I've been watching South Africa with interest. There's been a lot of protests actually. About that a little bit, um, but you know, this is the kind of information that we have that we can make use of. And you know, sometimes when I get these alerts, it's nowhere near where our group would be. But you know, we just kind of want to know these things. And if if I did see something that was concerning, I would reach out. I would probably go talk with. If it's an ICA, you know, Haji and I would probably, or if it's a graduate ICA. We would um, talk about that a little bit, and then say, "All right, let's let's reach out to the faculty member to be sure um, that they're aware of it." And sometimes they're aware of it. Sometimes they, you know, don't know at all. Um, you know, and then we kind of make a determination. Okay, this probably isn't going to impact your program, but just keep it on a radar screen. Or um, hmm, let's change the itinerary. We did that once. We reworked an itinerary so that we could just move completely around an area that we were concerned about. And for assessments, I would recommend trying to do them a few months out, and then within a few weeks mm -hmm. of it, you can easily update it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the security team's um, usual. Like, you request them sometimes when you're actually planning the program, right. and that might be six to nine months in advance. Right. And then you just do periodic <coughs> updates and say, hey, what's changed? Mm -hmm. And I think the nice thing, if, if we do those assessments, and we tend to do those for higher risk destinations um, for students, um, what I find is that once I have expressed an interest with the security uh, team at OnCall, they'll keep an eye on it anyway. They'll say, oh yeah, I know marshall has got a group of students, and they may reach out to me and, you know, proactively and say, we're really concerned about what's going on in this area. Are you still moving forward with your plans here? Um, so, you know, <clears throat> I can't, that's, that's not their responsibility to do that. <clears throat> that's just them being really proactive and um, great people, but, you know, it is something that, you know, it's nice if we have that on, on their radar screen, so. Do you, you don't automatically do assessments for every trip that people, that is going on that? You only no, do it for I, no, I mean, it's, uh, like, an assessment that we get is, I mean, I guess we could, um, <laughs> I worry about overusing right. my resources and, you know, they're like, oh my god, Marsha is asking us again. Um, but, um, you know, because when I get an assessment, it's like a 10-page document. It's not just a, you know, uh, we do have, through the Searchlight portal, we have security information on all of these places that, that we can review in advance. So, um, and that's going to highlight some areas where they've seen trouble. Um, you know, particular neighborhoods or whatever. So, you know, and that information is readily available to um, us. So, you know, sometimes I'll just use that. Um, you know, Haji will come in with all of the ICAs and drop it down on my desk and say, 
these need approval. And so then I start moving through them and um, just looking to see what else is going on and if there's anything that, that we're concerned about. So you guys didn't know that we, we paid such close attention, did you? <laughs> One other thing I would mention is to not only think about the circumstances of if there's any political unrest going on or anything like that, but think about the people that are in your group mm -hmm. and if any of them have any high risk um, factors, LBGTQ community, you know, is there a higher <coughs> risk for them? Do they have to, should they take certain cultural considerations into it? So those are things that can be included in the assessment as well. Okay. All right, so some resources that are available. Um, we've mentioned the mysearchlightportal.com uh, website on the top left hand side. Uh, that is basically the login page. So what this is, it's a plan information portal. Uh, so it's got a little information on who we are, how to contact us, etc. some frequently asked questions. It also holds your plan documents and claims forms. Um, so if there are anything that you need to claim for, um, those forms are available there. And it also contains some links to CDC website, etc. cetera. Um, but importantly, once you log in, you can see on this bottom right hand um, screenshot, on the top left hand side of that, there's a link to destination intelligence, and that's what we were referring to. Um, so once you log into that, and the code for the My Certified Portal is on the top right of the screen. Um, it's also on your plan document, so if you don't have it, it's there. Um, this is going to give you some, it's essentially off the shelf advice for that selected area that you're traveling to. It contains a lot of important information. Embassy locations, hospital locations, um, stuff like business etiquette, general travel advice, etc. cetera. Um, they tend to be between 10 to 20 pages, give or take on the location, um, but it's, it's great information to have, to hold on to, to pass out to your students or whatever, have them review. Um, so definitely take a look at that for all the locations yeah. you're going to visit. I mean, it's a lot of the information that you need to complete the study abroad proposal for. So it's one stop shop, so you can just go right in there and get it. Perfect. All right. Um, lastly, they have a handout for this. Yeah, it's over there. Oh. So, okay. I didn't mean you have to hand it out. Yeah. Since we're on. <laughs> There's a yeah. So over there, please grab one of these. Um, this is not an app. It's just an easy way to store the contact information that you need for a Drexel and on call into your phone. Um, so all you have to do is you open a brand new text, you text the message Drexel U, all one word, and it's not case sensitive, to 444-999, and then just follow the prompts. We'll ask you for your name, your email address, etc. Fill that out, and it'll save into the address book in your phone. Um, and it's searchable, so if you forget what you have it under, you can just go into search in your address book, type in Drexel, type in on call, it's going to pull up all that information for you. Um, so I would definitely recommend making sure that all your students download this and have this in their phone prior to leaving so you know that they have our contact information if they need any sort of assistance. And we also have the old school little paper cards there too for when your phone isn't charged um, or if your phone gets lost or stolen. Uh, you know, I encourage you to do both. Uh, it's very thin, it won't take up much room in your wallet and it's a good thing to have. Great. So, this is kind of a stupid question, but does this apply to faculty as well, or is this only for students? Oh, we're only concerned about students. <laughs> 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 no, all, of this, all of this applies to faculty um, and staff as well. So, um, you know, we do ask our faculty to, to register their, their travel. There's not an approval process. Oh my gosh, so I would be oh. in big trouble if I tried to do something like that. Um, but, but we do monitor, and if I see that you're going to a destination that I would consider to be high risk, I, I may reach out to you. It, that's a little touchy because some people have been going to Pakistan for years, and they, you know, they, I think people worry that I'm going to try to stop them, and that's not my role. My role is to be sure that they have the information <coughs> that they need and that they're support, and if it's something that the institution might not be comfortable with, then I'm going to kick it up the chain and um, President Fry and Provost Blake can stop you. 
I don't want to stop you. <laughs> so that's work related, let you know. Because yesterday mm -hmm. there was an email um, that you said if students are traveling, like on spring break or something. Right. So should faculty send that email as well, or faculty should always register all of the travel? Personal travel is, is your own business. Um, I will say you can use the Searchlight portal and get that information and whatnot. Um, you know, when you're on your wild spring break trip to Cancun or whatever, <laughs> I'm not responsible for you. Um, you know, but at the, at the same time, what I've told people is, you know, you have these resources, um, you know, if you want, and, and you should all have for your personal travel as well, um, emergency assistance, um, you know, that, that you can purchase. When my family goes on vacation, we purchase, you know, for the two weeks that we're going to be away, we have that coverage. Um, you know, we can give you information for, uh, you know, Tokyo Marine, which um, is basically would mean that you would have the on-call support. But there are other groups, obviously, that, that you can get this through. Um, you know, you should have that. And that's also part of the education process for people. But, you know, most Americans, when they go abroad, they don't think about evacuation or repatriation coverage. And, wow, you're looking at a pretty substantial bill. If, if you need a medical evacuation, yeah, you don't want to have to have to pay for that. And it is true. Our government, the U.S. government, will help you to get back, but they're going to bill you. <coughs> it's not free. That's not part of what your tax dollars pay for. So. You can go through, if you have Independence Blue Cross too, you can go through, they have a partner. And it's really reasonable. You can add a rider for the amount of time you're going. Mm -hmm. We do that when our family travels. And I did it when my kid was in Belgium, first study abroad, because I, they were going to travel and I didn't want just the Belgian medical. I think for, like, the kid for four months was like 160 bucks. Yeah. And it included repatriation and, a, and emergency texts text mm -hmm. when there was the protests. He got a text on his phone saying, stay away from this neighborhood, there's protests going on. Mm -hmm. And his Belgian friends were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Why is that happening? <laughs> he said, they don't want to send my dead body back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's cheaper to send a text than a body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dark humor runs in our family. <laughs> yeah. I think that way is really useful. It's great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Awesome. So. Okay. Well, so um, thank you everyone so much for coming. Feel free to hang out for a little bit if you would like and um, grab a little more lunch if, if you need it. And um, yeah, we, we really appreciate the effort that you're making to, um, to do ICAs or to travel with students. We know that that goes above and beyond. Um, yeah, so we're happy to support those efforts and hopefully you won't need to talk to me at all, but if you do, yeah, we'll work through that together. So, thank you. Thank you, Barbara.